If you want to know how to build a full working home golf simulator for less than £1,000, you've come to the right place. In this episode of Show Us Your Golf Simulator, 10 handicap golfer Richard explains how he built this budget home golf simulator using some amazing money saving hacks from his hitting mat to his impact screen and projector. So let the man himself explain exactly how he did it. Richard, welcome to the Handicap Golf Channel and thank you very, very much for showing us, well, sharing your golf simulator setup with us. But first of all, Richard, can you please tell everybody whereabouts in the world you're from and how long have you owned a golf simulator? Okay, so I'm currently living in a place called Ballarat in southeastern Australia, just about an hour and a half from Melbourne. Um, I'm UK born and bred, but I came out here for a holiday and never went home about 40 years ago. Um, <laughs> I've actually had what you would genuinely call a simulator for about four months now. What made you get into buying a golf simulator? Yeah. So I was a bit of a COVID child. I've had, I played golf. I played golf with my parents between six, grandparents, sorry, between 16 and 18, and then gave it away for about 30 years while I had a career in education. And then I started playing a bit. So I, I bought a net and stuck that in my garage, much to my wife's annoyance, and that was a pain because I had to keep packing it up. And then <laughs> during COVID, I started looking at websites like yours and others and realized that I could perhaps do it. So I started by just building the screen and, and I could leave the screen up permanently in the garage. And then uh, the R10, the Approach R10, Garmin Approach R10 really changed everything for me and I realized that I could do it on a budget. So you've just mentioned there, Richard, that you are using the Garmin R10. Now, that was going to be my first question. What is your launch monitor? Um, so how much was that? But it was 799 Australian dollars. Um, you might have to do the conversion for that. So about 500 quid, I think. The disadvantage of it, the first disadvantage was that it, I saw a video on uh, Let's Play Through in about July 2021. And yet I couldn't actually buy one until May 2022. It took forever. And I was putting, you know, checking the whole world to try and get one. But it was very difficult to come by. Now, I noticed that you've created your own sort of DIY leveling stand for the R10. Is that right? Yep. I saw a few videos on people that had done it. And I had a, I'm fairly handy with my hands. So I had a piece of spare MDF. I just cut the shape, put in some bolts that are adjustable and uh, bought a cheap, um, spirit level for it and it's been terrific so my system is that in my garage where my sim is we'll come to that obviously um i just uh, measured everything really actually got the thing level level with my mat aimed at the screen properly and then i just got a big felt tip marker and marked out the position of the mat and the position of the the stand and now i don't have to worry it just goes where it is and it stays pretty level but i can adjust it if need be that's amazing. So how much would you say it cost you to build that stand? Oh, I don't know, a couple of dollars probably. What a great way to do it, because I've seen them stands online and they're going for a lot yeah. more than a couple of dollars. <laughs> it took me about an hour to build. I had the bolts and I had then they're, they're sort of adjustable and I had the spirit level, I think, was about $2. Uh, in my system, I have to put the, the Garmin away when I want to park the car, so it's nice to be able to just plonk it straight back in and get going. On that note, um, I know you've just mentioned that your sim setup is in your garage, isn't it? And you yeah. mentioned to me that you have to move your car in and out, so y your setup is very much a temporary one. Yeah, it takes me about a... Uh, the screen is permanent. I, you'll see, you've probably got some photos of how I park the car in the screen. Uh, all the grass matting is permanent except for my hitting mat. I move that out of the way. Uh, so it takes me about a minute once I've got the cars out. I have to take my wife's car out as well, just in case. Uh, I haven't hit anything yet, but you never know. <laughs> yeah, best, best make sure you move that one, definitely. <laughs> so you're just running your Garmin R10 on an iPad, is that right? That's correct, yeah. yeah. So as I say, everything's on a budget till I knew that it, I, I would use it. So it runs, I had an iPad. In fact, it runs actually better on my iPhone because it's a newer iPhone, but then it's more difficult to control. The iPad's an ideal size, and I just stick that on an old music stand I had so I can use the touch screen and, and control everything from there. Can you just explain to everybody um, the, the rough dimensions of your golf sim? Yes, yeah, so the garage is a two-and-a-half-car garage, so width really isn't a problem at all. I've got all the width I need. 
Uh, it's 18 feet deep, so I've got about 10 feet from mat to screen, and then about 7 feet to the garment. And unfortunately, it's only 8 foot 6 high, so that's a, that's a bit of a pain. But I believe you've, uh, you, you've cut into your ceiling rafters a little bit, have you? I have, yeah. Yeah, I, I looked at raising the ceiling, but we'll come to why I didn't do that a bit later. But uh, I've cut a slot for my driver. It's no good for anyone else. But uh, And the Garmin's not that accurate with the driver, so it, it's a safety measure. Yeah, I've got a, a little hatch I can put up and down if I want to hit the long clubs. <laughs> and, yeah, with, with 18 feet of, of space there in your room, you, you've got more than enough space for the Garmin to pick up your shots, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, no, it seems to work fine. So... What about your, if, if we move on to your, um, your screen and, uh, and, and the frame as well, let's start off with your screen. What, what size screen do you have? The screen's 10 foot by 10 foot. I got it off Amazon, um, and it seems to be a reasonably good quality. The thing that I liked about it most was the edges have been uh, sort of folded over and sewn, and there's grommets all the way around, so that made it easier to fix. I had to actually put in a few more grommets to... Uh, to make it, uh, to, to get it stretched tight. But uh, yeah, the, so the screen's 10 foot by 10 foot. Um, it's 10 foot, is, as it stands in the garage, it's 10 foot wide, but it's only about eight foot high. So I've just folded the bottom underneath. And I guess if so, I can just roll it up a bit and get a bit of new screen when it gets really bad. Yeah, that's a good idea. I've, mine's pretty similar. Um, the, the actual screen I've got is far too big for the space that I have, so I have it folded over at the top, and I've even got it folded over slightly at the sides as well. Um, right. So, yeah, when part of my screen gets a bit too dirty or it starts to get a bit worn, I can just swivel it around, so it's a good idea, that. Um, so you mentioned about the grommets. You, you've put some in yourself. Is that a difficult yeah. task to do, or is it quite easy? It's a pain in the neck. I mean, I just went to a local <laughs> hardware store and bought this thing that you hammer through it, and it it, uh, it was hard work, but uh, it, it wasn't difficult. It was just time-consuming, and a bit of swearing went into it. <laughs> when I came. Because I must admit, I looked into that myself. I, I bottled it in the end because I thought I've got a nice new screen. I don't want to mess it up by doing some shoddy DIY work. I would recommend if you're going to do it, buy the, the best quality um, punch that you can get because the first one I bought was a cheap one and it, it just wouldn't go through the three layers, well, the two layers of screen that I had. And you've also said in your notes that you, you've got a duvet cover behind. Is it behind the screen that you've got that? Yeah, so I used your trick and others that I, um, behind the screen, I ran a steel cable with, uh, you know, the little clamps you have either end to make it tight. And then I've hung, I put grommets through a, du a duvet. I mean, they're not, and then I've hung that directly behind the screen just to deaden some of the noise and protect the screen a bit. So is it actually, I, I get confused when I hear people about doing this online. Um, is it actually a duvet that you would sleep underneath that you put behind your screen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just an old right. one I had. Yeah, so I, I just knocked some grommets through that too and and just cable tied it to the wire. Can you just tell everybody what sort of benefit that gives you if you've got the duvet screen, the duvet sheet well, behind the screen? Yeah, so from what I'd, I'd read online, um, it improves the durability of your screen and it stops the screen sort of going being pushed back so far when you hit a ball. It also deadens the sound a bit. So a lot of people suggested doing it, so I've done it. I've no, I can't really say categorically that it's going to make a difference, but... It certainly helped the noise aspect. So how much did you pay for your impact screen from Amazon? Okay, $230, halve it a bit and add a bit, so about 130 130 pounds, something like that. And how, how do you like it? Do you think it's a, a decent screen? Is it good quality? Yeah, no, look, I mean, I, I, I've got a slow swing speed and slow ball speed, so it's not under... the you know, the pressure that some people might hit, but I love it. Yeah, it's it's bright white. Um, another tip that no one really told me, but I realised after a while, is you do need to make sure you keep your balls and your clubs clean. I mean, I'd, I'd come off the course and, and start hitting balls and then wonder why the screen was getting so dirty. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I've, I've cleaned it a couple of times and it's, and it's going okay. I've cleaned it with um, just warm water with a tiny bit of dishwashing liquid. And then I use a hairdryer. Uh, hair really do hope my wife's not watching this. And <laughs> then dry the screen so I don't get watermarks. <laughs> and it doesn't leave any water stains, does it not? 
Not not so far, but but I am very careful to dry it after I've washed. So I'm only I'm washing it in there's the the main area where obviously the balls are hitting, and I I wash that and don't use too much water. And yeah, no, I haven't got any water marks yet. That's good to know because I've never tried that. I don't dare try it, um, but maybe I'll give it a go one time. I might try it on an old screen though first and see how I get on before I do it on yeah, my new one. Yeah, I would. What about your your frame? Now, the frame that you've built is quite unique. I've never really seen it like, done like that before. So can you just tell everybody how you've built the, the frame that goes around your screen? Yeah, so I um, I was almost like golf sim porn. I was watching it all the time in these different <laughs> ways that people built screens. And everyone said you shouldn't build one out of plastic conduit because it'll break and everything. But it's so much easier to work with than <coughs> the metal stuff. So I came up with this idea that I would build a the surround quite a lot wider than the screen. Uh, and I did that by using shelf brackets, the right angle shelf brackets. They're, they're 40 centimeters away from the wall. So I, I built uh, up across and then down the other side about a meter apart. And then using the orange thicker electrical conduit, I bolted that to the, to the brackets and then I use bungee cord. I just bought a whole, like a whole roll of bungee cord, and I attached the screen to the orange frame. And I made sure the screen was quite a way away from the orange frame, so I have no issue with the balls hitting the frame because of the balance that I've got is also well away from the frame. And then I, I just, you know, I just use the connectors you get for if you're an electrician and put it all together and just bolted it to the, to the brackets, and it works fine. So. Is it, a, is it plastic conduit, did you say, or is it metal? Yeah. Yeah, it's just the stuff that you'd run, uh, probably the same in England, you, you'd run electrical cabling through it if you're building a house. Wow, now, now that is cool because um, I used to have um, a, a cage, I, I built a DIY cage, but yeah, I, I used a that. metal conduit. Um, and at the time, I was thinking about going for the PVC conduit. But again, similar to you, I'd heard that it, it shatters and it breaks if you hit it. But you've done it in quite a unique way there where it's far enough away from your screen that it isn't going to cause any damage. Yeah, so I've got the screen well enough away from the frame. And then the valance that my wife very kindly sewed up for me, um, the pieces of the frame that come out from the wall that support the valance are again it means that the valance itself is a, is you know about 10 centimeters away from the from the plastic frame so it's pretty difficult i've never hit it in the four months i've been hitting what do you mean by the valance what's that which part of that is a is your set oh, sorry the, the the black that's what i call it the, the black the black surround the cinema sort of you know the the cloth that are, people use curtains and stuff we bought some black calico from the local sewing shop and um my wife made some, uh, sewed it so that I could put grommets on that. So it's suspended from pieces of the PVC that come out from the frame and they're chained to the roof. And it's, I tried to Velcro it to the screen, but the, the sticky Velcro wouldn't stick. So I just use double-sided tape now. So, so th that's how you get that nice finish with just some double-sided tape? That, the double-sided it... tape sticks very well to the screen. It doesn't stick quite so well to the cloth, but... I've had to replace it once, but it, you know, it's, it's a 10 second job. That's a, a really interesting little tip that because it's something that I've kind of, it's just a little niggle that I would like to change about my setup. I'd just like to have it a little bit neater and tidier around those edges. And I've, I've thought about Velcro. I've seen Velcro used before in some higher end setups, um, but I've never thought about double sided tape. So that's a really good little tip that yeah. <laughs> I might try it. You can buy, get, Get the widest stuff you can get. It's about an inch and a bit wide, and it comes on a roll, and I just put about three strips down, and it works, works well. Moving on to your, your hitting mat, can you just please explain to everybody how you have created your hitting mat? Because it seems like it's quite an interesting setup you've got there. Yeah, the mat's my pride and joy, really. So when I had the net, I was just hitting off a very small bit of, turf that I bought on eBay, which was really nasty. And I used to get sore elbows. So when I set up the hitting screen, I initially started, I found we've got a local chain of uh, stores that sell rubber sort of products called Clark's. They're sort of nationwide here. And I've, I found a rubber mat that 
was used as uh, just something to protect <laughs> the legs of mechanics when they're working in the workshop. So initially I bought that, I cut it in half and sewed the two halves together and that gave me a mat of about 1300 by one meter wide, which was fine. And then in, so but it was in two layers and then I cut a hole in the top layer and sunk in a little piece of turf into that and that worked okay, but I was still getting sore elbows. And then I had the bright idea of you could buy very cheap yoga mats, the rubber yoga mats. So I bought about three of those and I just using contact adhesive, I just laminated the whole mat and built it up and built it up. So it's now about 40 centimeters deep uh, and it's got a, it's, it's firm, but it's spongy enough that I don't, doesn't hurt to hit off it at all. And then I was lucky, I had a friend that was tearing up some artificial grass in his garden and he gave me a whole lot of turf. And so I just so um, glued some turf onto the mat and that's what I've ended up with now. So how does it feel to hit off? Does it feel nice and like, oh, like it, normal grass? Yeah, it's terrific. I mean, it's great. So I was lucky with the turf and I don't know what brand it is, but it's got quite a thick pile. So if you hit something thick, it, you know it immediately. And uh, it's... It's firm, to, so I, I stand on my mat and, and hit, and so it's firm to stand on, but when you hit down, the, I suppose the yoga mats just give and you, you get a beautiful sensation hitting off it. I've looked into creating my own mat, not, not a full mat like you've done, but like a hitting strip area, and they've just done it with um, like a, a piece of plastic and they super glued some turf on top and they've got the, the foam bits underneath, so it's very similar to the setup that you've got. Um, just, just obviously slightly different in terms of size and how they've built it. But um, so, how much would you say your hitting mat has cost you altogether? Uh, I think about fifty dollars. Wow, it's um, mm. a very cheap way to create a, a hitting mat because they can be super expensive if you buy one brand new. So yeah. that's a great little DIY tip that you've gave, given everybody there, Richard. Uh, and certainly this one, like if I go to the range and use the range mats, I always end up with, I've got sort of sore tennis elbows, so I always end up with sore elbows, but I can hit 100 balls here without any issue at all. Now, I know you touched upon the, the, the grass and, um, the, the well, you, you've got some grass that surrounds your hitting mat as well, haven't you? Um, now, in the notes that you yeah. gave me, you mentioned something about the concrete and it can uh, cause some interference with the R10. Is that right? That is, I don't know how true that is, but I've certainly read that online. So initially I just covered the concrete with some old carpet and then I just didn't like the aesthetic look of that. So I bought some, uh, just some cheap turf on eBay and I put that around in the actual surround area. And then I had some leftover, some of this turf that I got from my friend and I've, I, you'll see on the photos that I've laid that down in front just, and behind just to make it look better. Honestly, I think for a, a budget setup, what you've created there, it looks really professional. So like, hats off to you there. I think you've done a really, Thank really you. good job. If we move on to your projector next, because a projector <laughs> and projectors are, I, I'm not really well up on projectors at all. And I've looked on Amazon and I've seen you can get cheaper projectors. You can go up and spend thousands of pounds or thousands of dollars on projectors. Now you've opted for one of the cheaper ones, haven't you? So can you just explain to everybody what your projector is and a little bit about it? Yeah, my projector is probably a disaster, although it does work. So I, I started looking on eBay and I saw this 4K, 4,000 4, <coughs> lumen, uh, projected yeah. for $175 and I thought well that's, that's fantastic so I bought that and of course later I read that um, there's lumens and there's ANSI lumens so ANSI lumens is what you want and other lumens are, are, are nothing so mine's about I don't know 700 ANSI lumens it's, it's very non-bright and it doesn't do 4k what the 4k meant was it would accept 4k and down scale it to 720 so i think that my oh, right. projector is 720p and for 700 lumens <laughs> my whole sim is sort of built on a knife edge and everything complements itself and it, it's it does the job i i can't use the fluorescent lights in the garage eh? well partly because i've broken one but they they really do interfere with the garment it, it flashes bright red whenever i turn them on so I, I have to have the garage fairly dark, and when it's fairly dark, the, the picture looks great. 
Nice, yeah. So and, it, uh, it gives you that simulator experience, um, and you're not too bothered about the the quality of the image as such. But it gives you a visual to aim at, to aim towards, and yep. you've got it on a pretty cheap price as well. So you get all the sensation. I mean, the trouble with my sim is that if I, if I think if I upgraded anything, I'd just have to up, upgrade everything. So it, it, you know, the Garmin's <laughs> well known to be not super accurate. I mean, it's a drive-through <laughs> sim. The, the screen's sort of, well, it's not dodgy, but it's, you know, it's homemade. So it, it, it's probably the right projector for my, my setup. And the other good thing about the projector is it's got Wi-Fi and Apple Play. So so you can literally just, yeah. from your so iPad or nothing. your iPhone, you can just Apple, um, it's yeah. just, you can just AirPlay to it, can you? The, the projector is actually an Android T. It's actually an Android TV, so... Um, it comes with a remote, and you can get Netflix, and the grandkids will sit in there in deck chairs in the warm weather and watch movies. That, that is great for a, a start-up projector for a golf sim. Um, I think it's really, really cool. No wires needed. Flip it from your uh, iPad or your iPhone, and it doubles up into something that's family-friendly as well, so it's always easier to convince the missus, isn't it? So, moving on, Richard... Um, did you say that you've got um, like a downlight from above your hitting area? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so um, I couldn't have the fluoros on even if I wanted to, uh, but I needed some light. So I just put a downlight in front of the projectors on the hitting area. So it just spotlights the hitting area. It's like you're going at, uh, sort of flying an airplane at night. You have to sit there for five minutes while your eyes adjust and then everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so can I ask... Um, Whereabouts have you got most of your inspiration from uh, in terms of the design for your sim room? Because I started off on Facebook groups and looking at other people's amazing sim setups. That's kind of where I got my inspiration from. Yeah, mine, I'm not really on social media. So mine was all YouTube. There was your channel. Um, there was uh, Hybrid Me. I watched a few of his, uh, particularly for the Garmin R10. David Maxwell, who's another Australian, he does a lot of Garmin stuff. And then I just trolled through, you know, how to build a golf sim and just saw what I saw. I always find it like it's a never-ending project and there's always stuff that can be improved, just little tiny niggles all over the show because the more simulator setups that I see, the more ideas that I get. And uh, I'm kind of hoping that that's what these videos are doing for all, all the sim golfers out there. I'm hoping that they're just providing a little bit of uh, inspiration every now and again. So you are obviously using the Garmin R10, and uh, I'm assuming that you're using the uh, free courses that come uh, with the Garmin R10 for E6 Connect. That, that's right. I mean, as I say, at this stage, everything's hanging together by a thread, so I didn't really want to sort of pay for other stuff. And I, I only have an iPad. I don't have a PC. So, yeah, I use the E6 courses, and they're fine. Um, and I use the Garmin uh, range software. I haven't used the Home is it Home Hero, Home T Hero, whatever it is. I haven't used that. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you've used the Home T Hero. Do, do you, I think you get a free trial with it, do you? Yeah, you, you do. Yeah, I just haven't sort of got around to it yet. I haven't sort of felt the need, really. Yeah, so do you quite like E6 Connect? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I've got nothing to compare it with, but I really like the feature where you can sort of just drop a ball anywhere on the course and practice from there. So, you know, um, the weakness in my game is, I mean, the the uh, I can hit a drive reasonably well, and it'll as long as I've got a shot at the green, it's the shot at the green that I muck up. So I'll go out on E6 on a course, I'll, find, I'll sit 150 metres from the pin, and, I'll, and you can press the practice button, and I'll just hit balls in from there. That's really good, and it leads me on to my next question as well. I was going to ask you, do you mainly use your, your launch monitor for practice, or do you use it mainly for playing courses? Yeah, so I would say I practice about 75% and play courses 25%. Uh, I like the Garmin app for the I'm not, I, I fully understand that it's not that accurate, but I like the Garmin app for the club and club data, so if I'm pulling a lot, I can just see whether I'm inside out, outside in, club face open. And over about five to ten shots, you get a pretty good indication of what you're doing wrong. So I use the Garmin for that. And then I use the E6. I like the E6 um, range and, and playing courses on the E6. 
the, the Garmin app, I'm not that familiar with it. Does it come with any sort of like little practice games or any skills based stuff that you can work on? Or is it literally just the driving range feature? Yeah, no, they they have kept updating it. I haven't. The, it used to be just the driving range feature. Now there's three different driving ranges and you can hit over water onto greens of different lengths. So there is I don't use it that much, but there's definitely the ability to practice uh, and play games on the Garmin. And they've updated, you may have read that it'll do the RCT balls now, so you can get spin actually measured. It won't do the spin axis, but it, it will, I haven't used them yet, but it will measure the spin more accurately, which is good. All in all, then, Richard, um, you can just give me a ballpark, a ballpark figure if you wish, but how much have you spent on your golf simulator setup? Uh, £950, 17 to 1800 Australian dollars. Wow. So uh, I think the the quality of your setup for in what is English pounds less than a thousand is amazing. And I'm hoping that if anybody's watching this video, they can realize that you can create such a, a good setup, a home golf simulator setup for less than a thousand pounds with a launch monitor that is pretty accurate and a little bit of uh, a little bit of hard work and DIY, less than a thousand pounds, you can have a working golf simulator where you are not only just practicing your game on the driving range, but you can even play some courses as well. Yeah, no, I, I was thrilled to get it in at that price. I mean, I you know, I, I sort of I'm envious of you with your SkyTrack, but because of all the other restrictions of my sim, I'm not probably going to upgrade until uh, I've got a better room to do it in. I think. Okay. Based uh, ba based on your Garmin R10, um, how good would you say the Garmin R10 is for beginners? Uh, for beginners, I'd say it's terrific. I, I mean, there's some um, a bit of hate about it online because it only measures. I think it measures about four or five parameters. It measures ball speed, clubhead speed launch angle, launch direction, and spin now. Um, but the, the calculator figures, I say, particularly I think for me, because I am a, a fairly slow hitter with slow ball speed, slow carpet speed, it seems to match what I'd expect on course pretty well. And it just gets me out there practicing. Um, I can take it to the range and use it there. It's, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, but fully realize that it's, you know, if you're a very low marker and you want to work on something and be deadly accurate, then... It's not for you, but on, on any given day, I would hit my irons you know, five foot past or five foot short of where I expect them to go. So I just can't hit the ball that consistently that it, it really affects me. Yeah, so this is what I think about the Garmin R10. I mean, if the Garmin R10 was available when I first bought my Skytrack, um, I'd have been going for the R10 all day simply based on the price, but also because um, I'm, I'm a average golfer i'm a weekend golfer i'm not playing off scratch or a really low handicap so all those super accurate data points that you would get with the higher end launch monitors don't particularly matter to me um i'm just bothered about if i can carry my seven iron within 10 yards of the of that uh, stock distance like it doesn't have to be spot on the yardage all the time so if the Garmin R10 is giving you relatively accurate data as an average weekend golfer, I reckon it would be an amazing investment for you to help you work on your golf game. And not only that, it comes with some golf courses as well, so you can play golf uh, from the comfort yeah. of your own home. I mean, I'm trying at the moment to increase my ball speed and clubhead speed a bit, and that's really accurate, I think. And the other thing that's slightly depressing is that when I first started using it and I thought that my carry distances and everything, I thought, oh, there's something wrong with the machine. But when I got back on the course, I realized that the carry distance is what I carry. I, I, I always <laughs> think I hit my seven iron so far, but that's allowing, that's allowing for about 50 meters of roll. <laughs> and I wonder why I go into the bunker and the water the whole time, because I, I just don't carry it as far as I thought I did. So it's been a, an eye-opener for me in that respect. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely one thing that I found since having a launch monitor is it gives you a bit of an ego check, doesn't it? Because you you yeah, come certainly. from being on the course where you're thinking you're carrying a 7 iron 200 yards or whatever, and then all of a sudden you're carrying a 7 iron 150, 160 yards, in my case anyway. What would you say is your favourite part of your golf simulator setup at the moment? Uh, my mat, without a doubt. You worked hard on that and you've got it to Just made practising more, much more possible, really. And what would you improve in your golf simulator? 
Well, sort of as I said earlier, I think the problem with my simulator setup is that, it, as I say, it's balancing on a knife edge. If I improve just one thing, I'd probably have to, I'd end up improving everything. But um, I don't know. I suppose the thing that would be we good would be to have the extra height, but then the Garmin's renowned for not giving accurate driver figures anyway, so there's no point doing that. I could improve the... <clears throat> I could improve the projector, but I can't have the lights on in the garage anyway, so that wouldn't help. I honestly wouldn't improve anything until I could improve the whole lot, I think. If you did have a choice of any launch monitor, which one do you think you would go for? I think the GC Quad, just because uh, you wouldn't have to worry about space behind. So my wife doesn't know this yet, but uh, when we move houses, we will as we get older. We're going to have a small golf sim room. And if I could use a GC quad, then I don't have to have such a big room. <laughs> yeah, good man. That's exactly what I'm going to be looking for. If I ever move house again, I've got to. It's got to have a room that is big enough to fit a golf simulator, and it's got to be bigger than my garage that I've got right now. Yeah, I don't think you told us what is your golf handicap at the moment. Uh, my currently I'm ten point eight on the world system. The lowest I've been is six point seven. Uh, and we're coming out of winter here, and I always go out a couple of shots. So playing to nine on my home course is just about achievable. And I always wanted to have single-figure golfer on my gravestone, so I managed to do that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, it's a very similar story to me, I guess. Um, I'm playing off something similar to you. I'm hovering around about 11 or 12. Um, I got down to seven once upon a time for one week only, and then I've slowly yeah. crept back up. <laughs> um, I've never thought about having single-figure golf on my, on my greystone, but I might look into that. <laughs> right, have you got a favourite golfer of all time, Richard? Yeah, uh, Rory, but I, I'm a really big fan of the, the, the golf swing. So Rory, Adam Scott and uh, Freddie Couples would be my top three. Yeah, all those ones with the envious golf swing that we're all trying to work towards. Now, you don't have to answer this if you're not into it, but um, do you have a favourite footballer? Well, the thing was that when I lived in Bedford back in the 60s, so I vaguely had an interest in Chelsea. I had to pick a London team. And uh, this will go back a bit, but Peter Benetti, the cat, was their goalkeeper. And I don't really follow football now, but I'm, I do like the big events. So I follow the World Cup, the European Cup. Yeah, Peter Benetti, that's a name that I've not heard for a long time. It was before my time, no, but no. Uh, um, I just want to say thank you very much for, for showing us your golf simulator again. Um, and I just hope that people watching this video can get a lot of inspiration with how cheap you can actually create a, a home golf simulator. And you have definitely given me some extra ideas that I could potentially do with my setup. Um, and if I'd have seen your setup when I first started, I'd have been stealing all your ideas because I think they're amazing. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. If you'd like more information on Richard's home golf simulator setup, then check the links in the description below this video. And he's also kindly agreed to drop his email address in there as well. For more home golf simulator content, click on this video right here.